I'm talking today with Jeff Finkel, President and CEO of the International Economic Development Council, and Craig Richard, President and CEO of the Tampa Bay Economic Development Council and former chair of IEDC. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Doug. Now, our subject today is what CEO aspirants, these are senior executives who aspire to be CEOs in an economic development organization, need to know about governance generally and about the board specifically uh, so that they succeed in working with the board once they do reach the top spot. Let's begin um, by talking about the board chair relationship. And why don't we kick off with you, Jeff? Tell us what you've learned about turning the board chair into a real partner. You, you know, with the exception of Craig. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, no kidding, please, in this video. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, I'm very, I'm very fortunate in that my relationship with virtually all of my board chairs, uh, particularly after their board chairs, is one of a good personal friend. Um, you know, you, I may not have known them that well as we entered into uh, the chairs, but uh, I've, uh, you know, I make a point and they, they work at it too, uh, to spend, uh, you know, Craig and I probably talk at least every other week for a half an hour or more. It depends uh, on the topic. Sometimes more times a week. <laughs> yeah. and, and, it, uh, and we would tackle the various issues that were ahead of us. Yeah. The promise that I make a chair is the first thing they will hear from me is any HR changes. Somebody leaves, they're going to get a call. Uh, if I'm getting ready to hire somebody, I'm going to give them a call. If something's blowing up, I'm going to give them a call because I, I always kind of viewed HR as one of those things that, yes, that's my responsibility, but it never is a good thing if it ends up in the chair's lap without me having shared it with them. Uh, and so, but we also would talk about what's going on with other board members, what's going on with the budget, what's going on. And uh, frankly, when the chair, during that year, the person is chair, they know more about the ins and outs of the organization than they probably ever expected to know because I wanted to make sure that uh, they were apprised. And, and frankly, a chair is going to hear from other board members and they're going to say, did you hear this? Or, or I'm really concerned about what's going on in the organization. And if I have, if I am sharing my heart out, so to speak, uh, you know, within reason, uh, Craig's going to be able to say, it's okay. Jeff and I have talked about it. I'm aware of that. You do not want your chair getting blindsided. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned Good a point. long time ago, forewarned is forearmed. That's right. And uh, so that, uh, and you know, I, I actually do help teach our managing EDO course, and this will be the last thing I say at, at this particular juncture. I, I refer to what gets uh, CEOs in trouble is not following the cool hand Luke rule of thumb what we have here is a failure to communicate. Mm -hmm. And if you're communicating, it's probably gonna be okay and you're gonna get the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're not, you're gonna get yourself in trouble. So. Okay, what would you yeah. like to add? Well, he mentioned the number one rule, which is to err on the side of over communication. You wanna make sure your chair is abreast of any problems, any potential problems. But I take it a step further. If you're going to present them some issues, make sure you present some potential solutions as well. 
They don't want to be in the, the mode of trying to fix your problems, you know, make their job simple. You know, it's okay to give them the issues that you're facing, but give them the solutions that you're also looking at. And they may want to, you know, provide some input and some feedback uh, or some insights into their experiences as a uh, CEO. But um, just you definitely want to keep it simple for them. Well, Jeff talked about communication with his various chairs, including you, Craig. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about your communication with your chair? Tell us a bit I, about that. I learned a lot from being the chair with Jeff. <laughs> um, it's you want to treat your chair as you know as you would want to be treated, and so it was important. It's important for me now that you know I communicate regularly with my chair. Uh, we have scheduled times that we call each other. And just as Jeff said before, if there is an issue that is bubbling up, I make sure my chair is aware of it before it bubbles up and becomes an issue. Um, that's, that's one of my key rules when I work with, with my chair. Um, you know, I know this show is for aspiring uh, CEOs, but the one thing that I would add in, in that vein, if you have an opportunity or chance, you know, when you are the CEO, you definitely want to shape uh, who the chair is going to be as much as you can. You want to influence that decision as much as you can. You have to do it in the right way. But, you know, if you see some potential um, problems with uh, some of the candidates, you want to make sure your candidate is, is top. Uh, in consideration for your chair. But you wouldn't send out an email endorsing a candidate for chair. <laughs> <laughs> that might, might be your last email, actually. That's, that's yeah. all about, you know, <laughs> fairly, <laughs> your fairly. relationships. <laughs> well, let me, Jeff, you wanted to add? Well, you know, um, it's funny. I'm sure I've had some influence on leadership and the organization. But where I work harder in influencing uh, the, the process is on new board members. Mm. I, uh, I figure that in many cases, I'm going to know many of those people better than the nominations committee. So I, I spend more of my uh, political chits on, uh, on who are going to be new board members. Um, and if, you know, and, and uh, the, we're very fortunate and we always have three past chairs as the chairs of the, no or the, the team of nomination committee members, they know what we're looking for in new leadership. And, uh, and so uh, I, I don't have to worry about that as much. And, and, I, and, and they're not going to listen to me in some cases. And so... I don't uh, use up my chits there. Um, well, but you, you, you raise an interesting point because there are different types of board models. And your board is truly, you know, nominated from, from the beginning. Mine is more of a pay-to-play system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have as uh, the, I don't have as many options when it comes to picking and choosing uh, who my board is going to be. Yeah. So, you know, some, you know, if you pay the amount, then you're automatically on the board. Now, what we've done in the, you know, since I got here was develop more of a hybrid system where we can bring on a, a slate of board members in a certain categories, you know, if they're at certain investment levels. But, you know, that's an important distinction, you know, between the types of boards that you have. Right. Yeah. Let, let me throw in a, one more question related to the board chair CEO relationship. What do both of you th think you need to know or want to know about a new board chair before you start working with that person? What, what, what information really helps you build that relationship? So I'm going to go first, if that's okay. Um, when Craig was vice chair of our board, 
we, we, I take, and you, you're aware of this, Doug, I believe, I take our vice chair to an ASAE, American Society of Association Executive Forum, that deals with the chief elected officer, chief executive officer partnership. And we spend uh, effectively almost two days uh, just talking. Uh, the, the, the way the system is built up, we go through Myers-Briggs. Uh, I'm a little bit of an introvert. Craig's more of an extrovert. Uh, we talk about management styles. We talk about how often we should communicate. We talk about IEDC strategic plan. We talk about uh, future leadership. We talk about what is the vice chair of the board going to do when Craig is chair. Uh, and it gave, it gave us a lot of opportunity. And by spending those two days, we were able to take shortcuts in our communication later on. Mm -hmm. uh, we, could, uh, we, we were building that relationship and such that uh, it wouldn't have taken us 45 minutes to work through an issue. Sometimes it was a 10 minute conversation because we already knew where each other was coming from. And I assume you get a pretty good sense of your new chairs or your vice chair's uh, personality, communication uh, techniques, preferences, and well, even philosophy and values, I suppose. So the, the one question, I don't know if Craig remembers this, but I've asked every one of the incoming chairs, how will I know if you're upset with me? Mm, what a great question. You know, I want to make sure that if we're starting to get off the rails in some way, that we know how to stop and, and uh, calibrate. Mm -hmm. Craig, want to add anything? No, I mean, that's an important understanding is from the, from the outset of the relationship, kind of setting those boundaries and expectations moving forward, you know, you get a feel for, you know, a, certain, a person's tendencies and what they like and what they uh, dislike. But it's also important to understand them well enough when you're not hitting on all cylinders, you know, what are the key, what are some of the things that will indicate that? And then as important, understand what it's going to take to get back on the right track. And, um, you know, fortunately, you know, if, if you constantly communicate, then there's lots of opportunities to recalibrate and get back on the right track. But as soon as the communication stops, then it is that much harder to get back in line and get back on track. Bottom line, I think, neither of you is distant or arm's length from your board chair. Correct. Both of you build a... a close relationship, which actually has many personal elements to it. You get to know this person really well as a human being, not just as a force right. in your environment. And, and I, I would, I would uh, key in on something that Jeff said, er, said earlier. You probably don't start off being friends in that type of relationship. I mean, you want to, you know, and it's, and a lot of CEOs will make that mistake in thinking that the friendliness is a friendship. And you got to always remember, you know, your chair is your boss. And so you want to make sure you maintain that distinction. Now, afterwards, you know, you got along well and think, you know, you end up being friends in many cases. And, and even in my situation here, um, I'm still in, I mean, many of my past chairs, we play golf or we go have wine together. I mean, we've developed a friendship afterwards, but, you know, I never took it for granted that their friendliness was my friendship, you know, during the chairmanship. Yeah, my, my job was to make sure that Craig was prepared for meetings. My job was to make sure that I resolved issues or proposed solutions to issues. Uh, my job was to make sure that uh, Craig didn't spend more time worrying about the organization than he thought he was going to have to. Uh, 
and uh, and that he got out of his year as chair as much as he wanted to get out of it within my ability to control it. Uh, so you made an effort to know what he wanted to get out of oh, yes. year as chair, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to say that it's necessarily about Craig, but, you know, he was the the chair of the largest economic development professionals association in the world there ought to be some recognition of craig uh besides being the board chair of that but there ought to be some recognition of that as craig knows i don't speak at our annual conference that many ceos make the mistake of thinking that they're the most important speaker at a conference and and I want to make sure that people like Craig, uh, who are the chair at the time, have the key roles. And uh, um, and and you know, and you know, I as I said, I'm a little introverted anyhow, so I'm more comfortable uh, leading from behind as opposed to leading from the front, where Craig uh, uh, has a level of comfort that's probably greater than mine. Hmm. Well. I'd like to continue in this vein, but we, we have three more questions we want to talk about today, so let's move on. Um, a big issue in governance, as both of you fellows know, is board engagement. How do we engage the board in key governing processes? So board members feel like they own key governing decisions and products. Craig, why don't you tell us how you've engaged your board in the area of planning, both uh, operational and strategic. What, what have you done to make them feel that they yeah. have an ownership stake in this key process? You know, during these, this COVID era that we're having, I'd, I'd have to kind of distinguish pre-COVID engagement versus post-COVID engagement. Uh, Pre-COVID engagement, you know, strategic planning, you know, it brought, it, provided an opportunity to convene our board in like work session environments. And we would host a couple, two or three of these sessions to talk about strategic priorities of the organization, direction of the organization, and really get into, uh, get them more informed of what our economic development priorities ought to be. And that worked out really well. Then you end up having, you know, wrap up sessions and final presentations. I have to constantly remind my staff that while we know our strategic priorities inside and out, your board won't. And never feel like you're over repeating some of these strategic priorities. Um, we live and breathe it every day as professionals, but the volunteers, they'll come in and, you know, once a month, every other week or something, they don't have that, the benefit of understanding the ins and outs of all of the tactics of every one of the strategies. So you keep the engagement in, in, in a work session type that provides the feedback. And the other benefit to that engagement is that they get to the benefit of bouncing these ideas off of their peers and colleagues as well. So they're building relationships, not only with the organization, but within, you know, the, the folks that are in that room as well. On the operational side, I like to, uh, to get smaller groups or task force or smaller committees on these operational items or operational priorities. And uh, we'll form uh, operating committees uh, per subject or per pillar of our strategic plan. And that has worked exceptionally well. Now, in the post-COVID environment, you know, that's been a, a little bit more challenging mm -hmm. because you're working in a virtual environment. It's really tough to gauge, you know, if these topics are resonating with some of your uh, board members. And so I end up using a lot of polling uh, tools. So we'll poll, um, you know, before a meeting, we'll poll after a meeting, we'll poll during a meeting just to get a sense of, you know, are we in the, is everybody rowing in the right direction right now? So, you know, that's the, 
the, the distinction I would make between a pre-COVID environment and post-COVID. But even when things start to get back to normal, I think I'm going to in include more of these polling tools moving forward. It's one of the things that I've picked up um, as we've gone uh, through this post-COVID environment. Well, we've learned some valuable positive lessons, actually, oh, yeah. uh, from COVID-19, though it's uh, certainly um, uh, an unfortunate development, to put it mildly, but at least we've learned a lot more about what we can accomplish right, right. in virtual situations. Jeff, would you like to add anything to so, in you terms know, of board I, engagement? I, I have to remind our, the, the staff um, of how do we put things in front of the board? What are the decisions we need out of the board? And, and frankly, how do we uh, put things in front of the board uh, that leads to success for what we're trying to do? And, uh, and uh, you know, so right now, uh, I'll give you an example. We're trying to roll out a new certification for uh, people who work in the area of, of with small businesses, an entrepreneurship certificate. And, uh, you know, I walked through with uh, the staff member yesterday. What did they need to do to make sure that they were successful in getting it through one of our board committees? onto the board agenda and, and a, a level of success. And, and, you know, I picked up a certification to teach high school when I was an undergraduate. And it's about education. It's not about necessarily sales, uh, although you do want to put yourself in a position to get to yes. But, you know, you, I told her, you need to tell them what we did to get to uh, a, a, a a proposal to their committee, who advised us along the way, what research that we did, and uh, how we ended up coming up with the conclusions that we've come up to, to, to that point. And I am confident after she tells the story uh, with the PowerPoint to make sure that her committee uh, feels like they know every step that we've taken and we've done appropriate due diligence, I'm pretty confident that they'll say yes. They're gonna ask some questions. They may tweak it. It could use some tweaking, I'm sure. Uh, and then they'll go in somewhat excited to a board meeting and they'll help her sell it. In fact, uh, the committee chair will be in fa uh, fact taking over the sales at that point or the presentation. And I told her that she needs to make sure that that person is well prepared for the board meeting. Uh, they can turn her down easier than they can a board member. Uh, so if I have a board member actually making the presentation uh, with their committee backing them up, we're going to we're going to be successful. Well, that would be a whole new subject we could explore in part two: turning board members into change champions. Yep. Or uh, uh, and speaking of structure, you mentioned the committee. Um, structure is one of the uh, preeminent issues today in governance. And Jeff, I know you've done a lot of uh, restructuring uh, or it, uh, did when IEDC was formed. Tell us a bit about the structure you put in place well, for and, your board. Uh, Doug, this would be an advertisement for you because you were our consultant uh, and helped us get through it. So. Doug walks into my office one day, we happened to be in Washington, and he says, how are you doing? And I says, I'm doing terrible, Doug. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we, uh, we did merge two organizations uh, in order to avoid uh, any no votes on the merger. We had an 80 person board, 35 plus 45 equals 80 every time. Uh, we were working our way down to 55, but we also had about six or seven committees. And, uh, and it was such that I could not, the, the span of my ability to listen and hear what was going on to, uh, at all those committees was very difficult. And Doug, uh, with Doug's assistance, uh, 
we set up three committees. I mean, obviously we had a governance committee, we had an audit committee, uh, which meets small uh, nominations committee, but the three working committees of the board was a performance oversight and monitoring, planning and business development and external uh, member relations. And Doug also said to me, I had to be uh, at every one of those committee meetings and I needed to sit through every one of those committee meetings. And when Craig was chair, he sat through them with me. Uh, so the, the chair sat through them, the CEO sat through them. Um, and in fact, uh, it made for a much smoother relationship. We, uh, uh, it worked out very well, the restructuring. And I wouldn't change darn near anything from, the, from, what, we, uh, uh, from what we did and how we approached it. Craig? No, I think I'll speak to the IADC governance model um, because I think it really sets the tone for a lot of other economic development organizations, believe it or not. I mean, we're, we're set up very similar from a governance standpoint to IADC's model. Um, the, the, the key difference, again, is because my board, some, many of my board members are on the board by right of their investment level. Uh, nevertheless, we have the same type of setup, you know, a, a big board, uh, a governance type of committee of, uh, where work really happens on the governance level. And then these uh, advisory committees that uh, focus on the key areas of the operation of the, of the, of the operations. And um, that works really well. We, um, the board chairs and leadership, uh, they're re not really required, but they are definitely um, suggested heavily that they attend these meetings so that, you know, they can get a feel for what's happening uh, at every one of the levels within the organization. And they're able to speak about it. Um, and it, it really helps when they're you know, chairing a meeting, they can speak intelligently about what's happening in each one of these governance areas. So um, I think that's an important feature of organizations like ours is to have these opportunities where members and investors can provide that level of input and engagement at every level of the organization. Well, you know, <clears throat> there are, there's a lot of talk around the country about uh, how great it is to have a really small board if you can bring that off. And so down, it's frequent to see downsizing projects. Uh, both of you gentlemen know that I'm a fairly vocal critic of uh, downsizing uh, because you lose diversity, you lose brain power, yeah. you lose community connections, uh, you lose a lot mm -hmm. for some gain in efficiency. But um, Jeff, you have what would be called a large board. Yeah, it's now 50 55 some right. people. Right. It works apparently, IEDC, the IEDC board is considered a very effective, very strong board. Would you say it's committees that, well-designed committees that make that work? So, you know, let, I, let me tell you that um, being a membership organization, I, I'll get to your specific question in a second, Doug, but being a membership organization, you want representation um, throughout our membership base. Uh, our bylaws require us to have a member from the European Union. Uh, it requires us to have a board member from Canada. Those are the only two uh, specifically uh, called for in our uh, bylaws. So that leaves us with 53 slots. Um, but we have, um, with great pride, we have uh, diversified our board in ways that uh, uh, most uh, organizations could only dream of. Um, for instance, uh, in this most recent nominations process, you know, and, uh, you know, we're going to pat ourselves on the backs. Other organizations have probably been there before. 
adding our first uh, Native American to our board. We're adding our first Mexican national to our board this time. Um, uh, Craig w was African American, uh, and uh, I still am. Still am. Uh, How are you? Okay. <laughs> and, but here's what we were proud of as an organization. The person that followed him was African American as well, and it, it was not. We barely noticed. Uh, I mean, it it just it was natural to the uh, the. Uh, uh, the way we operate as an organization. We've put into a position somebody who's going to be our first Latino chair is uh, probably going to be chair in about three years. And uh, um, so we could not have done that without a bench that was 55 persons strong. Uh, mm. We probably have 40% women on the board. We uh, uh, it, it's a uh, diversity, both professionally, geographically, race, gender, uh, is, uh, is very strong in IEDC. If I'd had a 13 person board, I, I'm not sure I could talk about it with the level of enthusiasm that I share for what we've accomplished that way. It would and, have been impossible to be as diverse. Right, with the thirteen-person uh, board. And if we had to, if we had to downsize, I would hate to even think how we'd go about doing that without losing this thing that we are are very uh, proud of ourselves for doing. Um, second, our committees do work, and uh, we do get a lot of work out of our committees. We just had a very successful strategic planning process where. And even under this as uh, using Zoom, it ended up, I think, with people feeling pretty good about the process and the product. And, you know, uh, I will tell you, and I'm sure this is true of a nine person board as well as a 55 person board. A third of my board members are very visible, very active all the time. A third are probably average board members and a third we probably have to work at to keep them engaged. But I don't think that's probably different between yeah. uh, a 55-person board and a nine-person board, as I was right. saying. Right. Well, gentlemen, I know you both have um, extremely busy schedules, so you'll be happy to know we've come to our last question. I'm going to uh, toss this to you, Craig. Uh, tell us about any communication and interaction guidelines you follow at uh, the council to keep the board uh, CEO uh, relationship positive. We talked about the board chair, but let's talk now about mm -hmm. guidelines for communication with all board members. I think you have to develop a structured communications plan to your board, meaning there are timely communication either newsletters or letters or columns that come from the CEO. Uh, and then you have to actually have to plan, and I actually have on my calendar, plan touch points with my executive committee on a regular basis. And so if, if you're not intentional about that, it's gonna be easy mm -hmm. to put some of that stuff to the side because things always come up, but book it like a meeting, you know, if your newsletter is going to come out or your column is going to come out, you know, the third week of the month, you make sure it's ready to go and, and they can get it at that time. Um, and the same thing with your appointments with your, uh, with your board members and executive committee members. Um, just schedule it just like you, you know, every three months I'm going to meet with this person. And you, you know, do a round robin of that throughout the board. So there you have intentional conversations and contacts with, with each one of your board members. So you're talking one-on-one -on -one meetings. One-on-one -on -one meetings. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're pretty busy. I am. I mean, in but, terms of board communication. Uh, so, you know, with my board, it's also investor relations. So, you know, if I have a, a, a board members that are only, that I only talk to, once a year and that's the time when they're renewing their investment mm -hmm. it's not a good look not gonna cut it yes yeah, yeah. not gonna cut it 
So, you know, you want to maintain those relationships throughout the year. So when they finally get their invoice, um, <laughs> they would have heard from you before then. So uh, it, it's, it's more, my board relations are a mix between, you know, the governance relations, but also investor relations as well. Jeff, so, tell us about what you do at IEDC. I'm not going to go as, as deep as Craig uh, went. Uh, I, I think the, for the board at large, you know, we see board members throughout the year in a variety of, of settings and a variety of ways. Uh, but we turn out a report on an irregular basis, uh, and we call it highlights. Um, and if a board member is interested in knowing about what's going on in the organization, these reports uh, can be up to 30 or 40 pages. Um, it's, a, it's a narrative with numbers, and it tells a board member you know, in, in excruciating detail what we're doing and how we're doing. And, uh, and I will tell you, as a result of producing that document, I get almost zero questions at any board meeting. Uh, because they, f I think most board members feel like they have a pretty good idea of, of what we're doing and, and how we're doing. And, um, and so, and, and frankly, um, it was about three years, it, it, I, I, I started doing this out of, uh, you know, the, when we merged uh, in 2000, 2001, excuse me, uh, the QED board members knew me and trusted me. The AEDC board members knew of me and may, may not have given me as much trust, and I had probably not earned it. Uh, and, you know, some of them wondered, well, what do you do with your day? And if they're asking you that question, then you know that they don't think, you know, you're earning your keep. So we started putting out a report so that they had an idea of how many different things were going on within the organization. After I started that, the questions disappeared. Uh, I think people felt, uh, was, I was starting to sell people onto, you know, this is, you know, I'm, I am busy. I do travel. Uh, the staff is, is producing good things. And, uh, and I've been pr producing that ever since. You told me something in a conversation that really impressed me. Uh, I think it was over dinner uh, not too long ago, Jeff, that, and you do travel a lot, of course, you're CEO of an international association. You said when you arrive in a particular community, uh, you always make a real effort to reach out to a board member who lives in that community. I think that's what you told me. Uh, well, and I probably said, there is not a city in this country that I can't get off the plane and have dinner with somebody. Uh, and, uh, but I do, if I'm going to some place, I may be there for one reason, but I also will pack my schedule with other people and, and members to make sure that, uh, you know, it's the same for Craig. Craig's world is a little different. I mean, his job is to sell companies on locating in Tampa. He's, his, his job is to sell site selectors and on showing off Tampa. So if he's coming to an IEDC meeting in uh, Chicago, well, he also knows that uh, he can do some other business. If I'm going to speak at the regional economic development agency meeting in Chicago, I've probably got 80 members in that region that I can call on in one way or the other. Not that I'm going to call on, on all 80, I'll probably call on four or five. But, um, you know, it's, it's a but way to have a dinner with a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I want to thank you for creating what I know will be a uh, very valuable resource for executives in the field of economic development who do aspire to reach the top spot in uh, any economic development organization someday. It occurred to me while participating in this uh, round table, we have to do a part two. 
<laughs> we, um, we barely touched the surface of a very uh, complex and critical subject for CEO aspirants. So if you're game, we'll set up a part two and we'll talk about aspects of board CEO relations. We haven't had time to, to uh, dig into in enough detail. So thank you. I know you're both very busy. I appreciate your time. So do our listeners, I'm sure. And I want to wish you a uh, safe and satisfying week.